Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Char. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind the scenes videos and two minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. We are so happy to reunite with Shauna Festi. We saw her back in 2018 talking about her film Boundaries. Now we're talking about a very different film called Run, Sweetheart, Run. Um, she's the director and the co-writer of this film. And um, we're lucky to have her on today. The film comes out today on Amazon mm-hmm. Prime, which is very exciting. Finally, yes. Yeah. And yeah. Um, if you can, can you tell our audience what Run, Sweetheart, Run is about? Sure. Um, Run, Sweetheart, Run is, I think, about something every woman woman can relate to, being set up by someone and thinking they look amazing on paper <laughs> and then turning out to be, you know, the date from hell, basically, and having to survive the night. It was based actually on a bad date that I went on um, where it was like the guy that really did look perfect on paper. And everybody was like, Oh, you're so lucky to go out on a date with him. And I got all dressed up and I ended up running out of his house in the middle of the night. And I started in Hollywood Hills and I ended up in West Los Angeles. And it was just that, that night. I will never forget. Oh my God. Okay. I grew up in LA. That, that oh, yeah. is not a easy distance to cover. Um, no, it's far. <laughs> it's far. And it is literally what she does in the film. But I didn't know. I didn't know that this was a, a literal date of yours. So I, I'm sorry. Now I have to talk about this date. Was it, were you connected through a friend or? Yeah, it was a friend of a friend. I mean, it was when I was like, you know, I was at UCLA. I was a student. I was broke. Everybody was like, oh, wow, you're going out with this guy. He's so successful. And, you know, so I just had like these naive high hopes and I was really trusting and that was kind of one of the first times and I was maybe 21, 22, where I was like, oh, it feels really dangerous to be a woman. Um, not only on this date that everybody, you know, encouraged me to go on, but also on the streets of Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And when I was writing this film, I had just, you know, had a daughter. And also I think, so we talked when I made boundaries and like mm-hmm. the craziest stuff happened after boundaries. What? Because when we were on our press tour for Boundaries, um, Peter Fonda, who is Peter Fonda, you know, rest in peace. He's an amazing yeah. actor. Um, he went out on Twitter and tweeted um, something. Do you remember that off color? Yes, but you're reminding me of it. And I don't remember what he said. It, well, you know, it's not even important. Like right. I, I read it and was kind of like, oh, that's so Peter Fonda. You know, like I didn't, it didn't change anything, but we were literally on a press tour and they take us out of it. They cut all press. They cut all the screenings that we were going to have. And it was like crisis time Mm. because Mm. Trump's son then tweeted boycott boundaries, the movie. And Peter Fonda, it was in my movie for like five minutes total. You know, it was a movie about an animal rescuer and her Mm. relationship with her father. And we were getting death threats. So the head of Sony was getting death threats. It was like, are they going to pull our movie? Thank God Sony Classics didn't. And they, you know, they held on course. But a lot of theaters pulled the film from their theaters. And it was like in a matter of, gosh, like three hours, all the work that I had done making this film and all the work my cast and crew had put into this just got waylaid by the tweets of these two men that were both irresponsible tweets. And I was like, how is this, am I, is it, how is this happening to me right now? This feels so unfair. And I was so angered by that, that those, you know, their tweets could have that much power and they certainly did. And so that was one of the times where I was like, I've never written from this place before. I'm really angry. And let's see what comes out on the page. And that was kind of the genesis of Run, Sweetheart, Run. (laughs) Jesus. Right. Um, 
all of that's very topical and maybe it's your next horror film, <laughs> but I mean, mm-hmm. start writing it now because yeah. Elon has taken over. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Oh, um, speaking of horror genre though, yeah. is, is this something you're interested in pursuing, especially with your first kind of horror film uh, with yeah. run sweetheart run? Is it how, what makes it different than writing something like boundaries? I know boundaries mm-hmm. is personal, but this seems yeah. like this a personal, personal story too. Yeah, it sure is. I mean, it's personal in a very different way. You know, it's based on a trauma. Um, And I think one of the craziest comments I get after people watch the movie is like, oh, it was so much fun. And you're like, wow, okay, that's cool (laughs) that I was able to change that, make that trauma into something really fun. But that was the goal I I wanted to entertain. And genre was something that I always really wanted to get into. Um, You know, after my first film premiered at Sundance, it was a YA film with Carrie Mulligan. Mm -hmm. And it was about love and grief. And, you know, I was, I was feeling all that at the time that I was writing it. But my second script was, you know, about a group of bank robbers. It was genre. And I couldn't find anybody to make that film. It was Mm -hmm. really, really difficult to get that made. And especially back then, which was like 12 years ago, there were, you know, this feels a little muscular, like that code word of this feels, you know, we we need a director with a little more muscular films. And, you know, they're talking about other men I could give this script to. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. So I I felt like, you know, I kind of, um, I listened to everybody around me with what they were telling me I should do. I was like, I'm always a good student and that's a good and a bad quality, I think sometimes. And so I, it really led me to continuing on this path of telling more love stories or YA or things that, you know, most women are allowed to tell in Hollywood. And it wasn't really until Blumhouse, um, I had a few meetings with them where I was like, no, I actually do have a horror film in mind. I Mm -hmm. have something. And they, you know, trusted me and gave me the opportunity to make this movie. And now I love, I love genre. It like kind of like freed me as a director a little Mm -hmm. bit, you know, I got to tell a much more visual story for the first time. And, um, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to go back now. I'm kind of. A- <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I hope you don't, Shauna, because you can certainly flex with this film as a lover of thrillers and horror. You hit all the all the check marks um, on, a, on a film that I that I want to go see when I'm expecting thriller and horror. Um, but what makes your film so special is just all the hidden subtexts, mm-hmm. um, you know, you're touching on misogyny, you're touching on sexism, but sometimes it's not so hidden. Like yeah. you literally, this villain is literally saying he he wants to keep women in his pla- in their place, essentially. So um, can you talk about how, in a way, this film is your love letter to LA, as you've said, but is it also like your fuck you to Hollywood and the, the patriarchy? <laughs> totally. I mean, I feel like... <laughs> I feel like it's a little loud for a lot of people where they're like, no, there's a quieter way to express your rage. You know, maybe, maybe don't put it so on the nose, maybe make it in, you know, a less like kind of in your face way. And I just don't know how to get people to listen. When you look at what is happening to women in the world right now, like the last thing I want to do is whisper or be subtle for anybody right now. And I, I was hoping that my anger and that loud voice, there'd be room for that. And I think people still have a really hard time with that. You know, you can talk about, I don't know, God, Marvel and men getting revenge ad nauseum. But the minute you're talking about a woman that's really unhappy with where she is in her life and is actually pointing it out and saying it in a really kind of bold, loud, honest way, it's suddenly too much or, you know, yeah, let's, let's make it more subtle or just concentrate on the subtext of it. And I'm, I could make that film, but that wasn't where I was emotionally at that time. Let's talk about periods. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I'm here for it. I uh-huh. loved that it was a central character to the mm-hmm. film. Can you talk about writing that in and, and not saying no? <laughs> sure. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think that was, I think as a filmmaker, you kind of have to do things that you're scared to do. And one was confronting my own period shame. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in my mid forties. And when I was first got my period, it was something that you had to hide, right? You whispered the word tampon. The the question I asked most often 
pad showing, like, because that would be just mortifying if anybody saw it or knew that I, God forbid, and all the products that are being sold to us are about hiding it or making sure no one knows you're ever on your period or, and then the really crazy thing is like, oh, you don't, you don't do swim class. You don't go out and like, yeah. I have three roller skating when she's on her period. Cherie goes into the guy's house because that's what she wants to do. I mean, interestingly enough, a lot of people were like, oh, but she's on her period. Why would she go into a guy's house? And you're like, what? Oh my gosh. It's just- <laughs> oh my God. Um, wow. And so that was something I really wanted to demystify and, and show in a really bold way. And not only show like just to normalize it, but to show how the, her period actually saved her life in this film. Mm-hmm. Ooh, yeah. Well, on, on the topic of periods, um, when we were talking, when you were on press tour for Boundaries in 2018, you mentioned how it was really disappointing that most of the critics yeah. are older white men. And mm-hmm. that just, yeah. that yeah. wasn't your audience for the film. And yeah. you can argue that's not the target audience for this film, but maybe it is. So I, I'm curious to know what your experience is now, you know, four years later, has yeah. has there been some evolution in that? And are you feeling some more? What do you guys it? think? Have you seen? I mean, no. Mm. <laughs> It, uh, the landscape I feel is changing, but not fast enough. Yeah. And it's nope. not, it's not keeping up. It's not keeping up with the times. I mean, that sounds so old school, but it, it's not. <laughs> no, yeah. what, what it is, is the verbiage is changing. People are all about talking about how we need more inclusion yes. across the board, but the actions haven't changed. We still don't get access to things that we certainly should get access to at this yep. point. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, you know, when we're doing our press tour, we're talking to all this press and, you know, we're getting, I'm getting a lot of love talking to certain outlets. And then they're like, and the next one is a Rotten Tomato approved critic. And it is always a white man. <laughs> like, and it's just, and I, I think that's a, that's a big problem too. Cause I mean, look, I, I love for older white men to see this film. I think it's really important. And a lot of them have championed it, but um, rot, even just the fact that Rotten Tomatoes has so much power in mm-hmm. our line of work and who is certified and why are we like relegating cinema to a, like a tomato you know it's just <laughs> yeah <laughs> for a filmmaker it's so binary and i and i uh, love cherry picks i think cherry picks is super cool cuz then it's like mm-hmm. all right let's tell it as it is because you know would i want to see the film that every older white man is saying yes this is the film for me probably not like i would take a different recommendation and so i i I hope that the more critics of color and more critic women are becoming critics, but I sadly, I haven't seen like this huge change yet. I mean, it has to go to gatekeepers too, right? Like we get pitched by, I mean, this is the inner workings, but we get pitched by um, PR people that have just kept the same people for forever because they're reliable. They know who they are. Some of them have big outlets. Some of them don't but there's no venturing outside of that. But I also know the studios are telling them, oh, no, 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 you have to look at the numbers. You have to look at the numbers and who are they reaching? And you're like, then it's never going to change. Mm-hmm. Anyways, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would love to talk about music in this film. Yeah. I love when films get it right. And I loved the Strawberry Letter 23. Mm-hmm. I loved Oh Honey by the Delications. Can you talk about your music supervisor and and those choices? Well, I mean, talk about loyalty and business, like in this business, Randy Poster has worked on every single one of my films and he's been such an incredible ally. And, and he just thinks of those songs, like, you know, when you're getting your crew together and you're like, who's going to really elevate this material? Mm -hmm. Like who, you know, in selfish words is going to make me look good. Cause that's what happens on set. Like actors make you look like better writer. Your production designer makes you look more creative and your music supervisor just helps you tell a story in this unexpected way. And that's what Randy does is he has this like catalog, this insane catalog in his head. And, you know, strawberry letter was one of the, mo- one of the songs that I wrote the movie to. So I said, oh. to him, I said, okay, this is mm. one of my favorite songs. I wrote a lot of the mu- the movie to this. How can we utilize it? And he was like, great, this fits right in. And then I think he kind of built off of that one song, but he's such an incredible talent and his work is so like varied, you know, he always mm. just hits it. 
Yeah. But it's speaking really of- like, I think it captured the B movie, the B horror movie mm. kind of like throwback that we wanted to, especially the score by Rob kind of with that synth um, emphasis. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I, I did want it to kind of feel like the 80s movies that I grew up watching, mm-hmm. you know. Same. And, I said yeah. that during the film, like, oh, okay. this feels like the 80s. Yeah. I yeah, love yeah, it. yeah. 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 <laughs> you got it. Yes. I, I didn't know those films were such an inspiration when I was like 10 years old and like scared out of my mind when I was watching <laughs> them. But, you know, I, I definitely am nostalgic for that era. And I think out of all the genres I I've worked in, I think horror has to be the most memorable because when I think of what, when I think of all the things I'm scared of that I really think about, like, I'm still scared to swim in the ocean, (laughs) like water, you know, I'm still, I won't buy any of my kids clowns. Like when the TV goes, (laughs) I won't, (laughs) how is it with me? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I still think of Bloody Mary, like all of those things, like what other films can you say really affect your daily life in your forties uh, after seeing a movie 20 years ago, you know, showers, showers are still, we scary. were just oh, talking yeah. about pet cemetery. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Fucked me up to this day. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Totally. Well, well on the topic of talent, of course your yeah. two leads, Ella and Pilu just are beautiful on screen. Their chemistry mm-hmm. right and wrong, which is yeah. so appropriate, <laughs> but the last third of the film was stolen by this beautiful pit bull that you include. <gasps> yeah. And as soon as it happened, I was like, oh, I knew Shauna was going to have a dog in this film. I knew it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so can you talk about this beautiful yeah. dog and um, why you decided to make it a pit? Just everything about it was so perfect. Yes. Well, I feel like that's one of the moments where the film really feels like me, especially for people who <laughs> who really know me. Um, and, you know, I'm an animal rescuer. I'm living in Austin right now. I'm literally uh, fostering this guy right now. Um, Mm. (laughs) And I, the shelters are overrun with pits and they just have this stigma and people think they're vicious dogs, but they're like the most loyal, loving breed. And I really wanted, just like I wanted to demystify periods, I want to demystify the reputation of pit bulls. And so It was really, I mean, I don't know how we got so lucky to find that dog because she had those like (laughs) drooping nipples from having like these. Yes. I was like, it's a girl dog. (laughs) Yeah. Because I had called her mama dog in my, um, in the script. And I was like, I will never find like a trained pit bull with nipples. And I, we found her and she was just like so amazing. And I wanted her to really be one of the heroes of the story. Um, And I feel like that's, as a director, those are the little moments I get really excited about because this movie's going to go wide on Amazon. Like so many people are going to see it. And if one girl is like, oh yeah, I'm on my period, you know, or says it out loud, or can I, you hand me that tampon? Or like one person looks at a pit differently, then it's like, oh, this is, this is really rewarding. It's like, I'm, I sound so cheesy, but like, that's really my hope for that. Um, I, I know we touched on it a little bit, um, but can you talk about using LA as the backdrop? I mean, really, really rooting yourself in LA in this film. Well, I grew up in LA. I was raised in LA and I was kind of like a feral kid. Um, (laughs) I think we probably all were back in, you know, latchkey Mm -hmm. kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I literally had the key around my neck um, on a chain. Yep. And when that happens, you're the city you live in raises you is Mm -hmm. co-parenting and Mm -hmm. LA was the best at times. And it was also the worst, you know, and as a young girl, and I don't know if any of you guys identify with this, but there were so many moments in LA where I was taking the bus and a man would sit next to me and be inappropriate, or I'd be at the library with my friends and a guy would take off his pants in one of the Mm -hmm. aisles, or I'd be at the beach and we'd all be in our bathing suits. And there's the guy kind of jerking off watching you or something. And when you're 13 through 15, you kind of laugh because you don't know what else to do. It's kind of like, oh my God, you'll never believe what happened to us. Oh my God, it was so gross. Ah, da, da, da. And then like years of that, like years, and you're trying to deal with it the best way you can, but it starts to take a real toll. And the advertisements in LA, uh. like you know, when we were creating the advertisements in the movie, it was super fun until it got like super real because 
we weren't, we were looking at ads that had come out that year. You know, there was an ad where a guy, a girl was giving like a blow job to a Subway sandwich. And I'm like, this is what my daughter has to see every time she goes to school. It's the sign we pass. So there's like everyday in, indignities in Los mm-hmm. Angeles that you experience really take their toll. And I don't think we, we have the help we need to understand it at the time and really process it in like a healthy way until now when I'm, you know, 47 and I'm like, I'm angry. I'm really, really upset. Mm -hmm. And people are, why relax, what's going on? And you're like, I don't have an outlet for this. You know, Mm -hmm. how do we talk about it? This isn't okay. Thank you so much for sharing that because I I feel Mm -hmm. the same way. I know we all feel the same way way, but it's just kind of just an overall just exhaustion too. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. I just want everyone to leave me the fuck alone. Like yeah. don't even look at me. I started wearing a wedding ring, a fake wedding ring when I was in high school and I have been wearing it ever since because hopefully less men will bother me and it doesn't really yeah. work. But you know, just all these things that fuck with your psyche. Mm-hmm. So thank you for sharing that. Well, it's just it's that's just what I'm talking about. It's like why is like um a really kind of important moment between a mo- mother and daughter giving the pepper spray for the first time. Like, here's your pepper spray. This is how you're going to use it. You're going to keep it on you. And you're like, how horrifying that this is a conversation that we have to have with our daughters. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask, I was, I was really impressed with um, Ella Belitska's Mm. um, overall um, exertion in this film. Mm -hmm. I know she did all of her own stunts, but I'm curious how she ran through the streets of LA barefoot in a cocktail dress and didn't get injured just like her feet did you have yeah. to scope the streets before it was so started gross. running or uh, like yeah i'll be honest like this was a low budget movie so we were like picking needles up off the floor yeah. like, we didn't have these crews that could clean up properly and we were in the elements like we were shooting behind that dark um in that bathroom behind that gas station and we were hosing down urine and mm-hmm. just collecting everything we could I mean, it, she's a trooper. I, I don't know how else to say it. She's like, let's just get it done. And she had like these little tiny kind of cup, like bandages underneath her feet. <laughs> That's all the protection she had. And at the end of the night, like she was just filthy and exhausted, but she was such a trooper. It was really difficult because just as a person, I'm like, oh my God, look at what she's going through. Like, let's just get one take and then we'll do it. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's fine. We don't need any more. <laughs> yeah. But then the director in me is like, no, I can't do that. We And thank God she was like, Shauna, I can do another one. I got this. Let's do it right. Let's get it right. Um, and some of her, one of the biggest problems we had is like, even our crew couldn't keep up with her because she was, it was really scary <laughs> when she was running from Pulu, like she was running and she was committed. So, so many times I had to say like, Ella, can you slow down for our camera crew? Like, <laughs> like, move as fast as, as you are right now. And she's like, I know I'm just so in it. I'm just so in it. It's just like everything around her was terrifying. Um, and so, yeah, LA definitely played a character and, and helped me as a director, those mm. nights in downtown LA. Mm-hmm. You, you always have some really good casting agents, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, between boundaries in this film, congratulations. Thank you. Um, before we wrap, I, I wanted to just talk about really quickly. You're also in the podcasting world. Yeah. We're with Dirty Diana. Congratulations yeah. on that. Yes. Do you want to do you want to talk about that at all? Just well, we actually sold a little... it into a book series. So we're writing three part book uh, based on Dirty Diana. And that was another one of those things. Like, I think I'm just kind of trying to challenge myself to talk about things that are scary to talk about. And Dirty Diana was based on my own marriage where, you know, my husband and I hadn't had sex in a year. And I was thinking like, how do we get out of this? Mm -hmm. What is happening? Where did my desire go? Where did our desire go? How do we find it? How do, and it was another thing that I kind of carried with a lot of shame. Like, I can't talk about it. I can't tell anybody who do I talk to about this? And so that was a really fun project just to talk about sex from a female lens and talk about orgasm without feeling like, oh, this is something shameful and embracing it. I mean, it was another, I think, you know, I think now I'm, it's just like, let's tackle things we're scared of because other people are scared of it too. You know, mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. well, I'm you not- feel like a failure, you yeah. know, and totally. everything, everything you're being fed is everything's sexualized. You're like, 
anyways, we could have all of the conversation yeah, about that. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> Sexualized and seemingly perfect. Totally. Everything is filtered. Everything's filtered now. So yeah. 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 I, mean, I was embarrassed. You know, I felt like this shame that, yeah, my marriage was failing. I didn't want anybody to know. And we didn't really have anywhere to turn to. So um, both, both this film and Dirty Diana have been really healing for me, I think. Mm. Well, it's healing for us to speak with you, Shauna. And yes. we really appreciate that your publicist was like, she wants to be on your podcast specifically. So we appreciate that. And we appreciate you. Oh, um, of course. <laughs> I hope this is just the second of many. Cause yes, you yes. Guys are on my radar. I love the work you're doing. And I just, I will I'll always remember meeting you guys in San Francisco and, and just loving hearing your stories and, and becoming friends and how exciting it was to see you at Sundance. Yeah. Uh, yes. I remember that as <laughs> brief as it was, yeah. that was really exciting. <laughs> It was really exciting. Oh, uh, yeah. The film is Run, Sweetheart, Run. It's streaming now on Amazon Prime. And we've been speaking with Shauna Festi. She's the director and co-writer of the film and uh, a great guest of the show and, and friend of the show. So thanks for being on Bitch Talk again. Thank you so much, guys. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lynn. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show is edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions. podcast is a proud member of the bff.fm podcast network learn more at podcasts.bff.fm bff.fm best frequencies forever